Hello everyone and welcome to the Society of Editors Conference 2020. My name is Sarah Brown and I head up news partnerships for Facebook in Northern Europe. Sadly, I won't be seeing you in person this year because of the extraordinary circumstances over the past few months, but it's been incredibly inspiring to see the amazing work that publishers all across the UK have been doing to ensure that despite everything going on, you've been connecting people to the stories that matter most to them. This has been incredibly inspiring to see and Facebook hopes to continue working with all of you in the future to make sure those stories are being connected with the people who need them most. Thank you so much again for all your fantastic work and looking forward to all the sessions today. Hello everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nigel Railton and I'm the CEO of Camelot UK and have been since 2017. In the uh, current challenging circumstances, I'm so glad that Society of Editors annual conference is able to go ahead, albeit I suppose in a very different and imitative way. Um, we're now in our 26th year of operating the National Lottery and Camelot has supported Society of Editors for 19 of those 26 years. Thanks to your and your journalist invaluable support over that time, a number of things have been able to happen. National Lottery winners have been able to share their good news. Missing ticket holders have been united with their winnings and a huge range of good cause and charity projects have been able to highlight the difference that they make thanks to vital National Lottery funding. And the 30 million that's raised each and every week by National Lottery players has never been more crucial than it is right now. Earlier in the year, the National Lottery distributors announced that 600 million in funding was going towards COVID relief. Now that's the biggest financial contribution outside of central government. And we're continuing to work with them and others to do as much as we possibly can on this long road to recovery. We remain fully committed to keeping the National Lottery up and running and in particular supporting our 44,000 retail partners who have been vital to the National Lottery's success since 1994. And I must say they've done an amazing job, I'm sure you'll agree, through this uh, lockdown period and indeed through the whole Covid experience. We of course have a shared interest in that regard as well as many of our retailers and news agents so sell both our products and yours. I know that things are uncertain right now and for, for, many, for many of us, and I know it's something that's been said over and over, but we at Camelot are fully committed to supporting the Society of Editors and the UK media more generally. And we really are all in this together. If there's anything I or my team can do, or you've had any feedback on how we could work better together, then please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. Anyway, thank you for allowing me to say a few words and I'll let you get on with your session now. Thank you for all that you're doing and I hope that you and your family stay safe and well and hopefully uh, in the not too distant future I'll be able to see you again in person. Until that time, thank you very much. Uh, well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for once again finding the time to join us here at the Society of Editors Virtual Conference 2020. Now, as many of you know, we would usually hold our conference in person at this time of the year as a lovely location where the industry gathers to talk about and debate and discuss some of the most important issues facing the industry at this time and also to network and generally meet old friends and, and get new acquaintances. Uh, unfortunately, we know of all the reasons why this can't happen this year and so uh, we decided to do it virtually and instead of subjecting everyone to one or two days of constant watching screens, uh, we went for a deconstructed conference and have spread our debates and panels and, and keynote discussions out over over four weeks. And we're now into the last week of this. And so thank you to everyone that's, that's stayed with us for this long and welcome those of you who've joined us at this point. And I'm delighted to welcome here for our keynote discussion today, uh, the Right Honourable John Whittingdale MP, Minister for Media and Digital at the Department of Digital Media, Culture and Sport. Thank you very much, Minister, for finding the time in your very, very busy schedule at the moment. Uh, to join us and I know that you, you, I hope I'm not wrong in describing you as a great fan of uh, a, a free press. Uh, thanks very much Ian, that's absolutely right. Um, as many of you, you will know I've been sort of following media policy for a very long time. Um, I spent 10 years as chairman of the select committee uh, where I got to know a lot of your members uh, and then of course I've continued as Secretary of State and now as Minister for the Media and 
I recall that this time last year, I joined you for a very nice dinner in that very nice location in London. Um, and at that time, I broke off my own election campaign to be there. And I was thinking that as I was dining with you, certainly I would have never have guessed three things that would have happened. The first was that the Conservative Party was returned with such a good majority, including my own, I'm pleased to say, at that forthcoming general election. Uh, then that a few months later, I would be returning to government uh, with specific ministerial responsibility for the media, uh, which I again was delighted by. Uh, but thirdly, of course, that just a few weeks later, we would be hit by the pandemic. Um, that has meant that a lot of the issues which I was keen to tackle about how we can support and sustain a free press in the UK um, were not shelved, but in a sense became even more acute because the pandemic put obviously huge pressure on the industry. I've never been in any doubt of the importance of the press uh, and media um, as an absolute cornerstone of the functioning of a democracy. Um, and newspapers, both national and local, have an absolutely critical role in holding elected officials to account in exposing uh, malpractice or negligence um, and ensuring that voters understand what their elected representatives are doing. And I think you'll have seen the um, survey that was published quite recently, which demonstrated that um, turnout in areas where there was a thriving local newspaper was actually higher uh, in local elections. And that, in a sense, came as no surprise, but it simply proved what I'd always believed to be the case, that um, electors rely upon professional journalists in order to understand and know how their locally elected authority or indeed the national government is performing. So it is absolutely vital in my view that uh, newspapers, national and local, uh, continue to thrive. But obviously there is huge uh, economic pressure on them. Um, that was already the case before the coronavirus uh, hit us. Uh, we're in the middle of a digital transition, which is, um, I think, making traditional economic models uh, more difficult to sustain and newspapers in a variety of different ways are exploring how to um, become and remain profitable in a digital world. But the pandemic obviously um, has accelerated that process. Um, the first consequence of the, the, the media, whereas a lot, of the, um, a lot of the other sectors for which DCMS is responsible have suffered as a result of the lockdown um, requirements which have had to be imposed, which have led to businesses closing uh, the media's problem, um, obviously uh, the press, but also to some extent radio and broadcast media, was that advertising collapsed. Um, and that almost overnight removed the major part of their income. And for newspapers, of course, as well, um, circulation became difficult as places where traditionally people pick up the daily paper, um, such as railway stations or airports or uh, those, um, or indeed uh, a number of um, retail outlets, those closed down. And so we were very clear that we needed to try and help the industry get through it. Um, and that is something which uh, we have been very regular dialogue with the industry. I've held round tables, which you and others have taken part in, uh, but we've tried to keep in very close touch with the publishers throughout uh, and to respond to a number of requests. So some of them were, were very clear. I mean, the lack of advertising was clearly the biggest problem. And we were able to assist there because not just as, as a sort of government subsidy, but actually because it was very important for government to get across the message about the public health requirements. And so we did agree the uh, partnership, uh, which led to uh, obviously a major package of advertising ex expenditure and I'm told the most successful campaign ever mounted in terms of its reach and immediate impact. 
Um, and that has helped. And there will still be further government information, both in terms of um, the COVID crisis and the continuing health measures and the explanation of what the tiers mean, for instance, but also um, as we come up to the end of the transition period and Brexit uh, actually becoming a, a reality, that too has led to us to need to get across some messaging. So newspapers are playing a vital part in that. But then there were other issues which perhaps I wouldn't immediately have realised would become so uh, important to the industry, such as the difficulty which arose very, very early on, which you and I talked about uh, at length, which was this uh, way in which the ad blocking software prevented advertisements appearing close to content related to the crisis. And since almost all of newspapers were reporting on the crisis, that led to a massive drop in the advertising that was being placed. So not only was the far less advertising, that which was being placed wasn't actually appearing because it was being blocked. And so we had some very constructive conversations with the platforms and the tech companies responsible for that. And I think that we found a way through that. We also obviously managed to uh, persuade the treasury to bring in early the cut in, uh, uh, in VAT for digital publications. Uh, they brought that forward. Uh, and then there were such things as persuading local authorities that um, delivery was possible and didn't represent a health risk. Um, and so there were a number of different ways in which we sought to help. Um, and I'm obviously aware that, that you know, the problems haven't gone away and we will continue to do what we can. But we did regard it as very important that we uh, tried to do as much as possible to sustain the industry. But in terms of the longer term and the um, transition which the industry is facing, um, it's been clear for quite some time that there is this imbalance between the power of the platforms and the power of the public publishers. That's something which, when I remember, was first flagged to me several years ago. But since then, there have been a number of studies which have confirmed it. Obviously, the government um, asked Francis Cairncross now a little while ago to look at the sustainability of newspapers. Uh, and she made a number of recommendations. But one of the critical ones was the need to address this imbalance. Um, and there was also the Furman inquiry into digital markets. And then, of course, most importantly, uh, the Competition Markets Authority report, which identified very clearly that um, the balance was not right, that too much revenue was being retained by the publishers who had too much power in the market. Uh, and that ne there needed to be an intervention to try and address that. Uh, and I know that that is something which the industry has been calling for very strongly. I've talked to a lot of uh, people, I suspect, listening to us today about it. Um, and the government was very clear that the CMA report did make a extremely powerful case as to why there wasn't a re requirement for a you know, pro-competition intervention. And so that's why yesterday we published the government response to the uh, to the CMA report in which we essentially accepted all of the recommendations um, and it will lead to the establishment of the new digital markets unit under the auspices of the CMA which will have the job of ensuring that there are proper codes of conduct uh, to, uh, to ensure a fair distribution of revenues and that will get away, uh, underway very quickly. Um, we are hoping to give it statutory backing which obviously requires legislation um, and we will be certainly hoping to be able to do that soon, um, preferably in the next session. But you, obviously we're, that's a question for the government as a whole with lots of competing uh, requirements for legislation. But you know, I, I encourage your members to make the case as to why we do need to do that quickly. Um, there have been various other initiatives as well, which I've been involved in. Um, one of the things which I'm proud of having played a part in its creation, and we've talked about this in the past, is the Local Democracy Initiative, which is funded by the BBC. I know that a large number of your members have found that the um, support that the funding has given, allowing them to um, hire local journalists to report particularly on the activities of local councils, uh, has been very valuable and has led to a lot of stories. Uh, so I'm very pleased with the way in which that has gone and I hope it can be sustained and increased. 
Um, obviously, we've also been talking about the online harms agenda, where I think everybody agrees there needs to be action taken to counter some of the uh, most harmful content online uh, and to increase the protection of young people. But we've also been clear that there needs to be protection of professional journalistic content. Um, that is something we've made plain will happen. Uh, we've already said that it will not cover um, the newspaper websites. Um, sorry, and is that... Is, is, no, I think you need to explain, Minister, that, that you're having some work done at home. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll start once it's stopped. I'll, I will come back to online harms. I think <laughs> it all it all it all adds to the drama. It all adds. Yeah. We've also been talking to the industry closely about the forthcoming online harms legislation. I think everybody agrees of the need to take action to protect young and vulnerable people from some of the most damaging material which appears online. But at the same time, we've been very clear that journalistic content needs to be protected um, so that it, it, it is not taken down. Uh, and we've made plain, firstly, that um, journalistic websites um, and comments on those are exempt from the legislation, uh, but we're also um, in discussion to make sure that um, material which is produced from professional journalistic sources can be shared and not be um, removed as a result of the legislation. And that's something which uh, we'll continue to talk to you about. Uh, and then the other area um, which I've been very keen to pursue has been about the safety of journalists. I mean, I, I've done a lot of international work in the past in countries where unfortunately journalism is a quite a dangerous profession and there are far too many uh, journalists in prison in various countries in the world or sometimes subject to um, torture or even having been killed. Now that's something which happily doesn't happen in this country, but having said that, uh, we have been disturbed to find that nevertheless journalists have been threatened here. A lot of it has been taking place online, actually, uh, but obviously we've had one or two tragic incidents like the death of Lara McKee in Northern Ireland. So we've set up a committee for the safety of journalists and we are working together to produce a na national action plan uh, which has brought together the police, the profession, some of the lobbying organisations and various arms of government, my colleague in the Home Office, the Minister for Safeguarding, and we will be producing a plan with um, action points, which uh, I think already we've got a lot of support for, and that, that's a continuing um, piece of work. So there is a lot going on. I'm delighted that as minister, I, I am able to take forward some of these things because I am a passionate believer in the importance of a free press. Um, and even though we've had the immediate challenges of the pandemic, uh, there will be a lot of work to continue to do along in some of those areas that I've described. But thank you again for uh, allowing me to come and talk to you this afternoon. Thank you. For, thank you for being here, Minister. And thank you for that, that, that um, uh, comprehensive overview. And and uh, as with any um, uh, interviewer, uh, uh, I'm worried now you covered all the points that I was going to raise. However, however, I will I will go back on some of those issues. Yes, of course. If I, if I can. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yes, I, I think the industry has been waiting for some time for the response to the, the CMA uh, report and recommendations. And as you say, those have just come uh, from government um, uh, at the same time with the, uh, the House of Lords. Uh, communications to digital committee uh, coming in with its 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 report um, breaking news uh, the future of UK journalism with some pretty strong recommendations uh, uh, that are there um, it, it, it's great you wait for for the um, uh, you know announcements to be made from government and then they all come at once which is which is which is fine which uh, which is great that's what our business is all about um, picking up on the the um, the, the digital uh, the um, uh, the new watchdog, as it's been it's been named, uh, following the CMA's uh, report, and you said there about you know the industry pushing for this to happen as, as quickly as possible. Well, the industry has been pushing for this to happen as, as, as quickly as possible. I mean, what more can we do? One hopes that the government, if they're, they're backing this, will will now uh, pick up the impetus on this and and just and, and get it onto this onto the um, legislation through as quickly as possible. Um, well, I'm obviously keen that that should happen. Um, the precise detail of how it will work, I think, will be uh, become clearer when we've got the report of the Digital Markets Task Force, which, as you know, has been looking at this. 
uh, and they will be making recommendations as to the sort of greater detail of it. Um, and then we will look to um, ensure that the unit itself is, is, is sort of set up and running um, in the early part of the coming year. Um, and I hope that we can achieve quite a lot before legislation actually is enacted and reaches the statute book. I mean, I think, you know, the, the platforms know that the government is absolutely clear that this is going to happen uh, and the unit will be in place. And so obviously we will be talking to the uh, platforms about those codes of conduct um, straight away. Um, and then I, I, would, I would hope that it may be possible to get something in place even before perhaps legislation is enacted. Uh, but the fact that legislation is coming, I hope will provide a very good spur uh, to try and achieve uh, an agreement between the publishers and the platforms. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we have heard from Amazon today uh, that, that uh, on the day of the announcement that they are you know, keen to engage with the new unit. Um, uh, nothing to be sure yet from, from, from Facebook, who, who have actually been active within the industry with uh, their Facebook journalism project and uh, their plans to bring uh, Facebook news to, to the UK from, from the United States. Uh, of course, with the House of Lords, with, with its announcement, that, that brings in another area which the industry is very keen on, which is, which is payment for the news which is used on the platforms. And there's hopes that that would be included within the online harms bill when that comes forward. Can you see that happening? Um, I don't think it would happen in the online harms bill. The online harms bill is very clearly defined. It's about tackling that uh, type of content, which is very damaging to particularly young people and to impose this um, duty of care on um, the platforms, the major um, providers online. Um, I, th I think the issue around potential payment it would not be within the online harms bill. And as we've seen, it's proving quite difficult in Australia. Um, we are in touch with um, the Australians to sort of watch what's happening there, uh, and we will continue to do that. But I think, I think the hope of the government is that that to have a robust uh, framework within competition law enforced by the Digital Markets Unit will address a lot of the problem. But obviously, you know, we we will watch that carefully, and we don't rule out uh, further action. I see. So you see, it, it, there is the potential then that that could fall in, that the Lord's recommendations could come within the, the legislation with regards to the, the response from the CMA? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm the separate issue about some kind of payment for, um, you know, of an Australian kind, I think it, it is a separate issue, which uh, at the moment, uh, you know, we're watching to see how they get on. But, but I mean, our attention has been on the CMA report and, and that offering uh, and obviously, it's not just about relationship between publishers and platforms. It's also the way in which the digital market is operating in other areas, because you do have these uh, very large and powerful companies uh, that are in a position to exploit their power when dealing with, obviously, not just publishers, but small retailers and others. So it, it's to try and make sure that there's proper competition taking place and the market can operate fairly uh, in the digital mar market as, as much as it does in the physical market. And we've spoken there about um, the online harms, but then you were saying that, that, that there is an exemption uh, already there proposed for um, recognised media and their, their sites on uh, digitally, and the industry has been pushing for that exemption to be extended with with regards to its its messages and its work when they're carried by by social media, uh, by the platforms, um, and uh, th that you also mentioned beforehand about the the concerns with regards to uh, the, the, the platforms using analytics, um, and we, we talked about basically with the ad blocking, and um, that wasn't a deliberate that way that we take it. That was that was because of the analytics which had been created. Um, with regard to that, we're, we're, we're a, a, a blunderbuss instead of a pistol, a, a broadsword instead of a rapier was there. And that's, you know, one of the big concerns with the industry is that, that coming under pressure, the platforms will to conform, and then have to create analytics which then block out 
material which is which is bona fide a genuine uh, journalistic material for uh, for discussion and debate um is that uppermost in in your minds with these considerations i mean that is certainly um a legitimate concern um i i think that we are very clear that um well, that people should be able to share on social media content which is professionally sourced and produced by um, reputable journalistic organisations, um, and we are looking at finding a way to make sure that that happens. The, the, the challenge is to make sure that it applies to the publications you want it to apply to, and not to publications you would not. So it's a, it becomes to some extent a question of definition. Uh, you know, what exactly is a professional journalistic uh, enterprise? Uh, and there are a number of criteria on which you could perhaps uh, judge that. But that, that's, that's what we, we've been discussing with the industry. Um, and we will continue to do so. But I'm very clear that we need to find a way to do that. And I'm sure it can be done. I don't... One of the areas that the Society of Editors, for instance, has, has been concerned about, and, and let me just stress that no one in the industry, most of them, including the Society of Editors, uh, uh, wants to rail against anything which stops uh, the coverage of child abuse and self-harm and actively encouraging terrorism and all those kind of things, and we appreciate that. And there is also the area of disinformation and misinformation and fake news, which has arisen during the pandemic, of course. In that area there, opens up perhaps away from the mainstream media, the whole question of freedom of expression. How do you balance that moving forward with online harms about attempting to, to prevent harmful misinformation, disinformation, without at the same time uh, creating some kind of ministry of, of, of truth to decide what, what can and can't be disseminated? And I'm thinking about the recent uh, agreement that was announced between the government and the, and the online platforms with regards to reporting on the, the vaccinations uh, in the current uh, pandemic crisis. You're absolutely right that that is another quite considerable challenge because I, I'm a fierce defender of freedom of speech. Um, actually, you have a position at the moment where um, I agree with you, we don't want a Ministry of Truth in government, but at the present time, you have people deciding whether or not um, certain content is acceptable, and, and that is the owners of the, of the platforms. Uh, and so Facebook can decide that um, something is in breach of their, their terms and doesn't comply with their requirements and remove it. Um, and that in itself has already caused some complaint. Um, some to some extent here, but obviously also in the USA and elsewhere. Um, one of the things we would like to see is for the platforms to have an appeal process, which will be transparent, that they should make it more clear as to exactly what it is that, that, that they will regard as unacceptable. It will be there, you know, the duty of care is on them to have um, policies which ensure that damaging material does not go up, but equally they need to set out um what that is and also to have a mechanism by which people who can argue that actually this is not damaging it is legitimate comment um then that they should be able to exercise that uh, but you're right about um particularly anti-vaccine for instance which is going to be a huge challenge as you know the, the, our, our success in beating the covid virus will depend very strongly on vaccine and vaccine take up uh, so the last thing we want to do is to allow uh, myths and scare stories to be propagated about the vaccine. So that's why we've already had conversations with the platforms about countering that. But you know, on the other hand, where there is legitimate debate uh, on scientific grounds or anything else, then I think there needs to be a mechanism by which um, people can uh, appeal against arbitrary decisions. Are you confident with the discussions that you've had with the, uh, the, the, the platforms that with regard to the vaccines, which this agreement is about, that if it is a, a genuine uh, news article and debate uh, within the mainstream media, that they won't try and block, not that the sites themselves are news sites, but actually the dissemination of those articles through social media? Well, I mean, what, you know, I mean, I think um, the kind of um, stories that we will be very clear uh, we we expect action to be taken against are those which have no basis in science and are leading to 
um, fear in the general populace or indeed actual damage. I mean, to give you another example also related to the present pandemic, um, at the beginning uh, of the COVID crisis, you may remember, it was widely being claimed that somehow this was all the creation of 5G mobile phone masks. And it actually led to something like 100 physical attacks on mobile phone masks, which at a time when we have relied on digital technology actually to get by, was uh, extremely um, dangerous. So it's that kind of completely groundless fear mongering, which um, we would expect action to be taken against. You know, what is a legitimate debate in a reputable publication is a different matter. And um, thank you for that. And, and, and also thank you because uh, you, you're being very active in the uh, support of the industry with regards, as you were saying, the protection of journalists and uh, set up and, and chair the uh, National Committee for the Protection of Journalists, which the Society of Editors um, is joined you on that. Um, we had a debate earlier in the week uh, from held staged by some of our members in the, in the Northeast newspapers and also radio in, in the Northeast who were talking on this subject about the, the abuse particularly that female journalists receive, particularly uh, journalists of a diverse background receive, but also some, some male reporters um, and journalists as well, that it, it is you know, particularly vicious particularly nasty, there seems to be this feeling abroad amongst a, a, a minority, we have to stress it's a minority of people, yet a very nasty part, um, a group, who feel that they've got anonymity and that they can say what they like about that. And it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's somewhat bewildering that society has gone this way. Do you think that there's more that can be done by the social media giants or, or the industry itself can do more? Oh, there is more that the social media companies can do, which is why the online harms legislation is, is coming in to um, make sure that they do take that action and to, by imposing on them a, a duty of care. Um, I, I mean, social media is, has brought benefits, but uh, along with it, uh, there is a, a, the dark side. And um, as a member of parliament, I'm also very conscious it's, it's it, it, in some ways, MPs and journalists are similarly affected in that there's an awful lot of abuse that goes on. But it's you're right, it, it's worse against female MPs, against female journalists. Um, and you know, none of it is acceptable. And, 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 and there is a there, there is a horrible um, tendency for people to think that they can behave in a way that they would never do in the normal world because they can hide behind anonymity. And in some cases, they don't actually even hide behind it. They just feel that somehow it's legitimate to be incredibly uh, abusive and intimidating uh, online in a way that wouldn't uh, they wouldn't do elsewhere. And of course, there is already the law in that area. I mean, if people make um, threats of violence or, or uh, against people, that is illegal. And we've already had some successful prosecutions of that. I mean, one of, the, one of the, the points, one of the threads that came out of the debate, which um, uh, I, I, I thought of picking up on that, is that, yes, we're interested in, in journalists, of course we are, because it's our profession and it's our colleagues and they're, they're receiving all, all of this. But we don't forget the fact that you just mentioned MPs, that, that's our two, our two professions, politics and that, but there are an awful lot of people. That, that unfortunately face this kind of abuse, face this kind of kind of threats because they're out there, shall we say, in public life, and some of them, some of them not. So, picking up on what you were saying beforehand about about um, how successful the campaigns have been that the government had had um, had sponsored throughout the pandemic, with particularly local newspapers, but also national newspapers as well, about getting a message across. Whether or not there's a there's a there's room there for a campaign about this, about the the, the harm it causes to the fabric of society, um, among out there for everyone, not just particularly journalists, not just particularly politicians, but out there with with everyone and using the, you know the the good the good works of of newspapers to actually get that message across there in a, in an information campaign, reminding people of the harm it does in, uh, socially, but also. You start breaking the law from time to time and you, you will put yourself uh, in a position of risk. Well, that's absolutely right. And obviously newspapers carry an important function 
in uh, reporting on when that happens. Uh, and there have been some successful prosecutions. And I know that newspapers have run campaigns on this uh, issue very successfully. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the power of newspapers to try and raise awareness and to highlight uh, abuses of this kind, I think is considerable. Um, but the legislation will, will is the first step because ultimately it is for the social media platforms to have uh, codes of practice to uh, prevent this. Um, and that is something which you know we will continue to talk to them about. But equally, I think the media is in a very strong position for uh, bringing public pressure to bear. And, and with the, the, the financial situation, and, and it has been, I, I don't think I'm stepping out there to say it hasn't it's been a lifeline during the, uh, the, the pandemic and the crisis for local newspapers in, in particular, the advertising support from the, the promotional messages support from the, uh, from the government. And the Cairn Cross report, as you write for the state, came out with some recommendations and the, and the, and the government picked up on, on almost all of those. Um, can you, I mean, you, you've spoken of the value of, 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 the, of the regional press. I know we've noted to convince you of that, of, of the great good it does in, in knitting together uh, communities and, and, and in keeping them informed that it's so trusted locally. But can you see where any more support can come as we come out of, of, of the pandemic? Um, I'm thinking in particular, perhaps more financial relief, perhaps, perhaps tax relief for regional newspapers in some form. Well, that's something which you know I've talked to uh, the NMA about uh, and to individual publishers, um, and you know maybe to perhaps build on the local democracy initiative in some way. The difficulty we face is that you know you will have heard Rishi Sunak this week um, talking about um, the the state of the public finances as a result of the interventions that have had to be made. So you know, I mean, I think the Treasury is is going to require a lot of convincing because there isn't really much money left. Um, that's not to say that we won't continue to have those conversations. And if there is, if there are interventions, uh, and particularly maybe around tax relief, which is an interesting suggestion, uh, you know, we will continue to make that case. But you know, we, we have to accept that the wider picture at the moment is a pretty bleak one in terms of, of um, the likelihood of getting public finance either directly or through tax relief. However, the government does yourself do put a great store in, in the role of the press and uh, particularly at the, the Britain has been at the forefront of the uh, of, of promoting free press, free media throughout the world. Um, it would be somewhat of an irony, would, irony wouldn't it, if, if we allowed sections of that press to wither away and die in this country? Well, absolutely, and I'm determined that shouldn't happen. What, what, on the other hand, I think we have to accept is that the industry is changing, um, quite apart from the COVID crisis, you know, the, the transition to di digital is inexorable. It's actually been accelerated by uh, the events of the last few months with people now living their lives online in a way that they weren't before. Uh, but, you know, the industry is making progress in uh, building up digital revenues. Um, and that's why I think the CMA report is so absolutely critical, because, you know, the more that people rely upon online distribution of news, then we not need to make sure that firstly, um, the economics work, both in terms of advertising revenue, uh, and of course, um, in terms of, of subscription, and that obviously there are different models for that, and the industry is exploring different ways in which that might work. And of course, the Society of Editors members, we don't just cover um, uh, print and press and online, but also broadcast and, and radio. And, and uh, broadcast is going through major challenges itself. Uh, public uh, broadcasters um, are facing challenges. Uh, you know, the BBC's uh, challenges are being much documented. Have you got any thoughts on where you see all this going in the broadcast? I can tempt you. Well, again, I mean, the, 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 it is the same phenomenon. It is the digital world that has created challenges which were simply not the, even thinkable, of, say, 10 years ago. So in the broadcast world, of course, you know, it's not that long ago that we had, well, originally three major broadcasting companies in the UK, and then it went up with the advent of Channel 5 to four. 
Um, and now suddenly, you, and then you had Sky, of course, but then since then, and much more recently, you've had the advent of Netflix and of Amazon and Apple and Disney and Discovery and all of these making uh, very good programming, but as a result, putting pressure on traditional broadcasting. And I've never been in doubt of the importance of public service broadcasting. Uh, the market is producing some fantastic content, but there is still, in my view, a need for government to ensure that public service content is still made available. That is primarily done by the BBC, but not just by the BBC. Um, the public service broadcasters include Channel 4, obviously, which is government owned, but then the uh, major UK broadcaster of ITV and also Channel 5. So that's why we have recently um, set up a panel to consider the long term future of public service broadcasting. We have the Ofcom report on it coming out um, relatively soon, and that will feed into the work of the panel. Um, and in the longer term, we will be looking at what government needs to do. Uh, to sustain the public service broadcasting, which is still necessary, but we'll also be asking the question, you know, what, what is public service broadcasting in a very different world to the one in which it was originally created? And, and radio also is, uh, is an area that, you, that um, you're looking into. Uh, obviously, the society has members in the, in the radio news world as well. Um, I'm not going to say it's the forgotten arm. It certainly isn't for millions upon millions of millions of people that listen to it every day. Um, where, can you, where, where are your concerns there? Why was the review? Launched? Well, I, I mean, radio again is, is facing challenges. I mean, both immediately from the pandemic, uh, the same challenge of, of advertising revenue disappearing affecting commercial radio uh, and so we uh, tried to find a way of helping commercial stations and, and the best way we were able to do that was by reaching an agreement with Arkiva over the charges that they levy for transmission which represents the a very big chunk of the expenditure for the commercial stations um, and we, we've done what we can to help them through but in the longer term um, you know, we, we've been on a journey for quite some time now away from analog transmission to digital. Um, there will come a time when uh, it will become entirely digital. And actually, now there are other means by which people listen to radio beyond DAB. Um, I mean, I wake up every morning and say, play Radio 4. And my um, speaker, which I hope has only been listening since I said play and hasn't been listening previously, but it does then play me Radio 4 or indeed. And what is so remarkable is, is if I want to, if I'm in London, I want to listen to the community radio station in Malden, which I would usually have to drive you know, 60 miles to get. It will play that as well. So, I mean, this does offer great opportunities for radio, but there is no question that just as newspapers are facing new challenges and TV is facing new challenges. So so are the, the radio uh, companies. Um, and, and it brings with it real opportunities too. I mean, it's not, it's not all bad news. I mean, the technology is bringing fantastic opportunities, but what we need to do is help all of the media to make the transition into this new digital world. Talking of challenges, as we draw closer to the end of this conversation, and thank you so much again for giving up your time. Our reflections on we're eight to nine months into this crisis. Um, any any crisis of any length um, challenges the relationship between government and the media, particularly if if it's a free media. How do you think it's fared between our two organisations so far? Um. I mean, the media have played an incredibly important part. Um, in a sense, you know, if you television audiences have risen, uh, the appetite for news, um, I mean, it's been harder for print because of distribution problems and economics, but, you know, digital um, subscriptions have grown. Uh, there is no question that in a crisis like this, people want information. And just going back to what you were saying earlier about the danger of fake news and misinformation, one of the things that I think this has brought out is the importance of professional trusted content. Uh, and that is something which um, the, the public service broadcasters bring, but also you know, professionally edited, sourced, legally checked um, journalism in print. 
Um, and that is this, that becomes all the more important when you are trying to counter this sort of wave of disinformation and just sort of gossip and speculation. So I think that um, everybody recognizes how vitally important uh, the media has been. Um, the the re relationship between government and media will always have the odd sort of hiccup and a bit of tension. Uh, but I hope that by the actions that the government has taken to support the media, that has demonstrated how important we regard them. Thank you. And thank you for your comments regarding the value of a of uh, the mainstream media, trusted media. I think you'll be reading some of the, the statements from the Society of Editors on that on that matter. Thank you. Uh, one final question, and thank you once again for all of your time. One final question I've been asking all of, uh, uh, I'll just say my subjects, my interview, <laughs> subjects <laughs> of these interviews, sound like the Queen, my subjects, um, uh, interviewees, shall we say, with this, um, away from away from all that we've been discussing, um, when this pandemic and crisis comes to an end, um, on a personal level, what, what are you looking forward to most um, doing that you've not been able to do through all of this? You've oh, missed? I mean, I, I, that's an easy one in that, um, in turn, I, I was thrilled to come back as a minister in DCMS um, and to have a responsibility, particularly for the media, but also the other things too. But it's been deeply frustrating that I, almost my entire time as a minister has been spent talking to television screens or, or laptops. Um, and actually what I want to do is get out and you know be able to sit down with you and your members around a table and also to go and visit. Uh, you know, I, I'm, DCMS is a, a wonderful department in that we cover a, a wide range of sectors, all of which are, are, are very important, but also quite fun. And I'd like to get out there. I'd like to go and visit some television companies. I'd like to get into some newsrooms. I'd be keen to get around the country uh, and to talk to people directly. And none of that has been possible um, for almost the entire time that I've been back in government. So I hope that the time will come where I can actually come and you know meet some of you face to face in, in the places you work. And we will certainly look forward to welcoming you to, um, to another of our gatherings. Uh, Minister, thank you so much for all of your, your time today and, and uh, uh, for putting up with the, uh, the noise from your, your work you've done there <laughs> and the light fading. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, but I, I, it's not deliberate, but I'm becoming steadily darker as we've spoken. <laughs> 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 yes, but uh, I'm sure that there will that, that will be interpreted in certain ways. Thank you so much once again for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you wish to follow all of this again, then you, you can do on our website, societyofeditors.org. And to, to finish it all, I've then got a phone call right in the middle of this, societyofeditors.org. And of course, uh, you can follow us on hashtag Editors UK. Thank you for joining us. And I hope to, we'll see you again on uh, the last of our panel and debates. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian.